Welcome to this tutorial about uh, basic concepts and uh, techniques for uh, wideband beamforming. Uh, my name is William from the University of Sheffield, UK. Uh, here's my email address. The outline of the talk. So first uh, is introduction to array model for both uh, narrowband model and uh, wideband model. And then we talk about uh, basics of narrowband beamforming and uh, wideband beamforming. So basically why we are having this wideband one. So what's the reason for the different structures? And then we talk about two designs, two classes of designs. So first one is design of fixed wideband beamformer. So they are data uh, independent beamformer. And the second one is uh, adaptive wideband beamformer. Basically, they are data dependent. And then uh, we talk about the sparse array design. So how to optimize the sensor location to achieve better wideband beamforming. And this is mainly for uh, fixed wideband beamforming. Okay. And then uh, last is a summary. Um, there will be two parts uh, for this. Uh, this part th one is for the first three sections and part two is for the remaining three uh, sections. So first uh, is introduction to this array model. So array signal processing or sensor array signal processing, it involves multiple sensors placed at the different positions in space to process the received signals arriving from different directions. It has many applications such as radar, sonar, and wireless communications and many others. Okay, uh, this is not just for the receiving mode, actually, for sensor array, you can also do uh, transmit, okay, for transmission. So like beamforming, we have reception beamforming, we have also, we also have this transmit beamforming, okay. And the classifications of sensor arrays, so based on different criteria, you can have different arrays, like a spatial layout, so you can have linear arrays, so one dimensional array, a planar arrays is two dimensional or three dimensional arrays. And according to the regularity of their spacing, so basically the spacing between different sensors in the array. So you can have a regular uh, spaced array. So following some pattern, uh, specified pattern, okay. So regular spacing, uh, regular spacing, not necessarily to be uniform, it can be non-uniform, okay. As long as they are regular following um, some pattern, okay. Um, or irregular, so like random spacing, okay. And also based on the construction of individual sensors, you can have the traditional scalar sensor arrays. So each sensor, you have one output, that's a traditional scalar sensor array. Or you can also have this vector sensor arrays. So for vector sensor arrays, so each vector will give you multiple uh, outputs. So examples such as this cross dipole or triple arrays, or you also have this acoustic vector sensor arrays. So based on these different criteria, we have different sensor array systems. Uh, here is, a, is a, a general linear array as an example, okay? It's a linear array, so you have this uh, M sensors, so sensor zero, sensor one, and sensor uh, big M minus one. So you have a signal coming from one direction, theta, and then when the signal arrives at the different sensors, there will be delay involved, like this one. So it's sensor zero and sensor one, there's delay tau one, and sensor zero and the sensor M, big M minus one, you will have this tau sub M minus one. So you have different delays. And depending on, certainly depending on where you put the reference point, you could have advance, not just delay, maybe advance, right? Um, Consider a complex plane wave signal. So like ST times E to J omega T. So omega is a carrier, like in wireless communications, it's quite uh, common, right? So we have a modulation, we have ST, this is baseband signal. This is a carrier omega uh, frequency. So you have this signal coming and they are from this angle theta. And for linear array, the range of the theta will be from minus pi to minus pi over two to pi over two, okay? And uh, 
assume the signal received by the first sensor is just uh, this signal itself. So ST times E to J omega T. Then by this M sensor, so sensor M, small M, it will be what? It will be delayed by tau M, right? By tau M. So this signal received by sensor M will be ST minus tau M. And then there's E to J omega is brackets, so T minus tau M, okay? And uh, it's roughly equal to which one? Which this T minus tau M, because it's narrow band, so there's almost no change to the signal, baseband signal ST within this delay tau M. So it's roughly equal to ST. So you have this approximation. Um, we do this approximation because we assume ST is narrow, is narrow band. So has a narrow bandwidth and changes little during this time delay tau M. Or we can say that roughly the condition for that approximation for this approximation to hold is, is what? Is this one? The lead version is still highly correlated with ST or coherent, okay? Highly correlated with ST. So you can do this approximation. And uh, in practice, we normally work on the baseband signal. So we can remove this carrier uh, E to J omega T in this expression. And then as a result, you have this X M T equal to S T times E to minus J omega tau M, okay? And uh, if you have M, uh, have K signals, so big K signals, as KT, so K from zero, uh, zero to big K minus one. They are, uh, they have the same carrier frequency omega and they from directions theta K. And so K from, so zero, one, and two, this K, big K minus one. And then this is for one signal and for big K of them, then you add them together, right? So it's summation, so, small case index from zero to big K minus one. And this is uh, this tau M theta K, this tau M theta K is a delay for the signal from coming from the angle theta K, okay? So tau M is a function of this angle. That's for multiple signal, signals impinging on the array. We have this model. And then according to this, you put them into this vector form. So it's x0 t, x1 t, x big m minus one t. Then you put all this into uh, this vector. So you just put them here and uh, you will have this um, relationship. Okay, here you have got this height n. So this is the this is a noise. Okay, this noise is additive noise component. And normally we assume the noise is not correlated with the with the source signals. So S zero T, S one T and S big K minus one T. Okay. So you have this uh, relationship for this IM sensor. This is a whole, this is a data model. So for the whole array. And then in a more compact form, we can just have this XT using this vector XT to represent this. Okay. And this big A is a steering. So big A is a steering matrix to represent this part. And each column is a steering vector, we call it a steering vector for the signal coming from theta. This, this is a, for the signal coming from theta zero. This is for the signal coming from theta one and so on. So each one, we can use a column vector A omega theta to represent it, okay? So this is one column vector, another column vector. So each column vector, okay, here, we call it the steering vector of the array for that direction theta. And this is called steering matrix because, it, because the matrix now uh, consists of these steering vectors for these big K, minus, big K directions. And the steering matrix, and this is a source vector, ST, and here is a noise vector, okay. And this is a model for the narrow band case. For wide band, it will not be valid anymore. Because for wide band signals, the propagation delay between different sensors cannot be expressed in the form of a simple complex number. So for narrow band, the single frequency and this delay times frequency got phase shift. So phase shift can be represented by a complex number, right? But 
for wideband signals, you have different frequency components. This delay, this phase shift will be different for different frequencies. So you can't comply, uh, express that in terms of simple complex number and uh, it should be a convolution. Okay, so mathematically is a convolution operation is indeed. So assume again, so we have this big K source signals. They are coming from different directions. And then if you consider this delay, then this S XMT is so a signal received at sensor M, this XMT will be equal to this is a summation. So SKT minus tau sub MK. So tau MK is that's a delay involved for the signal SK coming from this direction theta K and uh, this relative, okay, this, tau, this M is the index for this sensor M, right? So relative to the reference point. So this one is tau MK denotes the delay from the M sensor to the reference point for signal SKT. And this reference point in the previous example, we use sensor zero, right? You can use any uh, place in space at the reference point. So if you use sensor zero, then tau zero K, then that's a delay uh, with respect itself, right? Then it will be zero. Okay, that's the uh, Whiteman model, right? It, you got SK is delayed, right? Delayed by this different amount. And this put them into a matrix form again. So we have this XT and then we have this um, matrix A, you have this source vector ST have noise vector. And here is a convolution. This is a convolution operation. So delay, mathematically is a delay. The delay can be expressed by the convolution between this delta function with the signal itself, right? The delta function is delayed by tau m k, right? So that's a convolution operation. And if you, okay, if you put them into the frequency domain, then it's very simple. It will be just like the traditional, uh, like the narrowband model. So for each frequency, you have a narrowband model. So this is a steering vector for that frequency omega, right? For the corresponding source. So this one, this one steering vectors. So that's why, you know, uh, in many cases, especially for DOA estimations, for direction of arrival estimation, you know, people work on this frequency domain so, so that they can use the narrowband uh, DOA estimation method in, for wideband signals, okay? Because for, in the frequency domain, you know, you have a simple narrowband model now. Okay, uh, back to this temporal uh, the domain, okay, this time domain model, this convolution, right? If you sample it, transform it into this discrete, discrete time form, okay? Discrete time form, so XM. So you have this, um, this delta function after sampling, this delay can be expressed in terms of this convolution. So discrete time convolution, okay, between this sampled version of this SN, so ST, so the SN minus I and AI, AI is the matrix, okay? This is a convolution, uh, discrete time convolution, right? So I N minus I. And this AI, the element or the entry of this AI matrix AI is given by this. So MK is MK element. So basically the M row and the K column of this A is given by this equation. So this result, this is a single function, right? It's like a norm is a normalized sync function and with different delays. So tau mk over t. T is this uh, sampling period okay? because when you obtain this discrete time form, you have some of the signal you have used uh, a, a specific frequency and that sampling frequency has a sampling period. So corresponding sub sampling period t. And uh, if you consider a, uh, a specific case, so uh, like a U array, uniform linear array, and with adjacent sensor spacing D, and D is alpha times lambda minimum over two, okay? So the lambda minimum is a wavelength corresponding to the highest frequency omega max of the signal. So 
and alpha is a factor, you can change the value after, uh, of alpha to change the spacing D, right? So you can, in many cases, we can choose alpha equal to one, but it can, it can be other values, okay? Depending on, depending on the application. And for this uniform linear array, so tau mk will be equal to m times this unity delay, right? Tau one k, okay? And uh, because they all have the same delay, but mul integer multiples, okay, multiplied by this m. So m times this, and see the speed of the signal. And then if you choose the sampling frequency being twice the highest frequency of the signal, that's the um, um, Nyquist sampling theorem, right? According to that, the sampling frequency must be at least twice the highest frequency of the signal. So if you choose that, then T will be equal to lambda minimum over two C, okay? And then in this case, this A, I, M, K will be equal to this, okay? Expressed in this form. Because you know, now you know all the value, right? You know theta K, you know the signal where, where the signal uh, comes from. And the, you, alpha, you give the value yourself, and then you can use this, so substitute this result into here. Basically, you can use this result to generate uh, the data. So when you do simulations for wideband array, you first, first step is you generate the data, right? You, you suppose you want to have five signals, one coming from one direction, like 10 degrees and 20 degrees and so on. So you know all the values that you can use that to generate the data. Okay, that's the first step of your uh, simulation. Because this here for this X, this SN will be the source signal. So when you generate, generate, generate the data, you got this already. You can use, for example, if you use um, for micro array applications, you can use uh, a speech signal, recorded speech signal, right? For this S, SN. So this result can be used to generate some simulated data for wideband array signal processing. So that's the uh, array model, okay. Now for the basics of beamforming, so for narrowband first, okay. The aim of beamforming in general, okay, uh, for the reception case, okay, is to effectively estimate the signal of interest in the presence of noise and the interferences coming from different directions. So you have signal coming from different directions, one or two of them or multiple of them you are interested in. So you want to extract those signals, right? So that's beam bombing. You want to suppress the interference signals, okay? Um, for the narrow band case, the structure for beam bombing is quite simple, okay? Basically, you change the phase and the magnitude of the received signals and then add them together. This change of phase and uh, magnitude mathematically can be represented by multiplying the signal by a complex number, like W0, W1, Wm minus one. So this, these are complex numbers. So mathematically it's given by what? So Xmt times Wm conjugate equal to Yt. You see here, okay, I put a conjugate here. So although in this figure it's W0, but actually the real coefficient I'm using is conjugate version of this. So strictly speaking, you should put a star here, so conjugate here, so W0 conjugate, W1 conjugate, okay. The reason to put the conjugate here is, is, is just for simplifying the representation in the following stage. So for example, when you do adaptive beamforming in the expression, if you don't put this conjugate here, then the expression will be um, not that neat. Okay, so that's why, okay, people would think uh, we would normally put this star here. So um, the effective, although we put W0, W1, and W minus one, but the effective coefficient is really Wm conjugate, okay. And then again, so for a signal st, e to j omega t from direction theta, and we already know this received signal by sensor M, XMT is approximately given by this, right? Given by this. And then you substitute, substitute this result into here, right? Then YT will be given 
by this. Now you see what you this if you consider this beamformer as a system, then the input of the beamformer is what is st times e to j omega t, and the output of the system is given by, by what is given by y t, which is again st e to j omega t. So the same as the input, but subject to an extra component. This scale is a scalar. So this one this extra component. So if you have an input signal to a system and get the same signal coming out, but it's a scaled version, then that scalar, we can call that scalar as a response of the system to that input, right? And also when an input, so, so coming through the system and it will come out, but the subject to a scalar, then in this case, we can also call the signal as the eigenfunction of the system. Okay, so for a narrowband beamformer, this narrowband signal is the eigenfunction of the of this narrowband beamformer. And this part is scalar, this part, there's a change to the input signal, right? So this change, we call it the response, the beam response of the beamformer to the signal. So we use, okay, use this P omega theta because it's a function of omega and also function of theta, right? To represent this. Uh, response. So it's given by this. And uh, you got, if you got this W, okay, you put this W into this vector form. So WH times A, A is a steam vector for that direction, right? This is the response of the beamformer, okay, to a signal with a frequency omega coming from direction uh, theta, okay. And if you simply, you know, using this to simplify this, uh, you can have a simpler form for this steam vector. Okay. Now, again, for this uniform linear array with inter-element space in D, and this tau m will be equal to m times tau one. And then uh, you have this result. If you choose D equal to lambda over two, okay, then this whole thing can be simplified to this m pi, so omega tau m equal to m pi sine theta. And as a result, this response, the beamformer response will be given by this equation. So quite simple result, e to minus j m pi sine theta, okay, times this omega m conjugate. And for given frequency, okay, if you have specified the working frequency of this array, so you know the frequency omega, and if you know the values of the coefficients wm, then you substitute them into here, okay? Then you can find the beam pattern, the so beam response. So we can use 25 to calculate the result in the amplitude response. Okay, P omega theta, okay? And we call this beam pattern, okay? So here, so beam pattern BP equal to, okay, in DB is this beam pattern magnitude divided by the so normalized by the maximum value of this magnitude. And uh, so it's in dB is given by this. And you can draw this uh, beam pattern, okay? So consider a uniform linear array with 10 sensor sensors and the uniform weighting. So the weight will be equal to one. So all equal to one. And then it's response, beam response given by this. And you can use MATLAB to draw this response. It's like this, okay, it's like this. So this is the uh, direction rival of the signal theta and it's from minus 90 degree to 90 degrees. And here's the magnitude in dB. Okay, it's like this. So it's one, 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 right? So you can see the beam, the, mo the maximum response is to the direction zero. Because why? Because if the signal comes from zero direction, that means it will arrive at the array with the same phase. Then you add them together, all the signals, all the copies of the signal, right? For, deep, uh, for these different sensors, will be added together coherently, right? You got the maximum response here. And if you increase the spacing of the beamformer, so here is for D equal to lambda over two, but if you increase the spacing, what will happen? Increase to lambda. You see here, you have two beams, one beam to zero degree direction. The other beam is to, how say, is minus 90 and 90 degrees. So you see what? You have two 
directions. Or if you consider the minus 90 and 90 as two separate uh, directions, then you have three directions, right? You have the same response, basically. So beam former response is the same for these three directions, okay? But actually, because this one is this one, uh, minus 90 and 90, they are the same to the, uh, to the array. So you have this, we call the spatial aliasing problem. That means based on the received signal or based on the response, all the beamformer has the same response to signals coming from different directions Then you have. So based on the received signal, you will not be able to determine which direction it comes from. It could be zero degree, it could be 90 degree, right? So in this case, you have an aliasing problem, okay? Spatial aliasing. To avoid that, okay, you need to reduce the distance spacing uh, for uniform linear array you need to reduce it and the maximum value is lambda over two, okay? So that's why we normally put this spacing D equal to lambda over two, okay? And if you have um, K equal to M impinging signals, okay, that's one, just one example. And then suppose the first one is the signal of interest and the others are interference signals. And then ignore noise. Okay, for noise free case, then for beam forming it's very simple. You just, uh, okay, you just uh, multiply the steering vector for signal zero. So S zero T, you got a response given by one. You multiply the steering vector by the coefficient vector for signal S1T is zero. So response will be zero and so on. So basically you want to find uh, this W which can satisfy this equation. If you can find this W, then this W will give you a good beamformer. Basically it has, it has a response one to the signal of interest and uh, response of zero to the interference signals. So as long as the matrix on the left is a full rank, and we can always find a set of array coefficients to cancel these M minus one interference signals. So certainly this solution, this solution, exact values of this coefficient vector W, right? They are dependent on the signal frequency and also DOA. So if you change the frequency, right? If you change the frequency, then this will change too, right? So, but for narrowband, you have a single frequency, fixed frequency, right? So this is a, this will be a constant, right? You can find a constant. However, for wideband signals, so a wideband signal consists of an infinite number of different frequency components. In this case, the value of this width, the so optimum width vector, so the value should be different for different frequencies, right? So if you find find the beamformer coefficients using this equation, then this W0, W1, W M minus one, it should have a different value for different frequencies. Or mathematically in very easy, we just put omega here, means okay, it indicates that, okay, this value W0 is not a constant. It will change with respect to frequency, right? So back to this structure, narrowband beamformer, if it's wideband, then you can't just put W0 here, a constant. You need to put W0 omega. So basically you have a different W0 or different W1 and so on for different frequencies omega. So it will be W0 is frequency dependent. Then how can you generate or obtain a frequency dependent response W0 omega for this, for this, for this value? Okay. So when you change the frequency, you change this. How can you obtain a frequency dependent response here for W0, W1, W minus, M minus one? Okay, how? Okay, you can design a FR filter, right? Finite impulse response filter. You can design a FR filter. Uh, FR filter, you can give, by designing the coefficients of the FR filter, you can obtain the desired frequency dependent response, right? So that's the idea. So for wideband, beam forming, so you have one solution is, okay, you put a FR filter behind each received sensor signal. 
So x0, t, x0 n, x m minus 1 n. So this FR filter, this is the FR filter coefficients, right? This, you find the coefficients which give you the desired frequency dependent response, W0 omega and W1 omega and so on. So if you can design those coefficients, then you can perform wideband beamforming effectively, okay? So that's using FR filter. Okay, certainly in the general case, you can also use, any, you can use any filter, right? So IR filter, infinite impulse response filter, or FR filter. And also for the analog case, for analog, okay, we call it type delay line, okay, TDL, just type the delay line, okay? The delay is delay, but it can be digital, okay? In that case, it will be FR and IR filters, okay? So that's one realization for this frequency dependent coefficient, okay, for the wideband case. And another choice, okay, we also called, of course, sensor delay lines, okay? Instead of putting more, you know, these types behind each received, received sensor signal. So this is alpha filter, okay. I just put more sensors behind it. Okay, put more sensors behind this original sensor. This is original sensor, but I put more sensors here and put one coefficient and add them together is also like a finite impulse response filter, right? But the difference is here, this delay, delay between these different types, it will be direction dependent. But in here, this delay is fixed. It's independent of the signal direction. Okay, that's the difference. But in theory, this structure can also generate a frequency dependent response. So this structure can also perform effective wideband beamforming. So, but this is a sensor delay line based structure, sensor delay line based structure. So you can generalize, generalize this idea to other array uh, geometries. So if you have a, originally if you have a planary, then you can put more sensor behind this planary. So you have a three dimensional array, right? You see here, okay. One thing is because each sensor is attached by one coefficient, this, these are constants, okay? So it's like a narrow band structure. It's like a narrow band structure, but doing wide band beamforming, okay? That's an interesting part of this structure. And the same thing, okay, if you have a three dimensional array with one coefficient attached to each sensor only, and it can perform wide band beamforming, which is similar to a planar array, two dimensional array, but with type delay lines, okay? So in this sensor delay line based structure, since no FIR or IR filters or TDLs are attached to each sensor, it's a wideband beamforming structure without temporal filtering, okay? And you can, as I said, you can generalize it uh, to other structures. So if you have this kind of array, okay, like circular array, semicircular. Okay, you can put more sensor behind it. This one, you can perform wideband beamforming. Okay, so a narrow band structure can perform wideband beamforming. Okay, using this concept. And in general, if there's a decorrelation, okay, so that's a boundary. Uh, that's a boundary between narrow band and wide band, right? When you increase the bandwidth of the signal to some extent, then you can't consider the signal as narrow band anymore. It will become wide band. So what's the boundary, the limit there? Okay. So in general, so if there's decorrelation between signals received at the first and last sensors, then it will provide benefit by employing the wide band beamform structure. Okay. So if they are not coherent anymore or highly correlated anymore, then you will benefit by employing the wideband beamform structure, okay? Otherwise, you can use the narrowband structure, okay? And in this tutorial, we'll focus on the structure with TDLs or FRR filters, uh, not the SDL case. But the algorithms and methods introduced here can be easily extended to the SDL case, sensor delay line case, okay? And now for the TDL, I have filtered this based structure. So the output 
yt is given by can be expressed in days okay using this structure so basically x0 you got x0 t x m minus 1 t so delayed by different amount right and multiply it by the coefficients and then add them together right so that's why we have this equation so in this continuous time form so xm t minus i ts ts is a sampling frequency or the delay between adjacent types this delay between adjacent types or the sum if it's digital then it will be the sampling uh, period okay so here's ts and uh, in total you have g um, types attached to each uh, sensor or g minus one delay elements okay so in this structure you have this okay sensor zero sensor one two and sensor big m and uh, big m minus one and then for the top delay line the length will be from zero one to j big j minus one so in total you have big j of them okay for each sensor so that's why you have this uh, result and you can put them into uh, this vector form right so yt so yt will be put all this into a vector all this into a vector so you put this w, w is a coefficient vector this vector okay you see you have a g of them right g of them so basically you put all the coefficients back to the structure again you put all this into a vector all this into a vector all this into a vector and then put all the vectors together into a larger vector okay so this gives you this uh, coefficient vector w right so in total you have j uh, big j sub vectors right each sub vectors is w0 w1 and so on is given by um, the column of coefficients right for the type of position i okay so wi equal to w0i w1i and w big minus uh, i minus one i okay and similarly this x is formulated in the same way so x is x0 t x1 t minus g t s so different delays right different delays and the final one is delayed by g big g minus one times this t s by this amount and so you have this um, x and w so you can have this vector form okay this uh, for this wide band beam former and by this formulation okay this notation okay this formulation incorporates the narrow band beam former with a special case of g equal to one so if g equal to one so here you don't have this we only have x zero t right so g equal to one then you don't have all this you just have this so it will be a narrow band beam former so this narrow band structure is a special case of this wide band one now we consider to find the beam response okay we consider again this single frequency signal e to j omega t we are not um, putting this, this baseband here because it's a it's wide band signal it's a continuous frequency range so we just consider one uh, single frequency e to j omega t and then put suppose the signal is j omega t then put it through that process then x m t minus i t s will be equal to this it will be equal to this and uh, this is the tau m is a delay and plus is this is the delay on this tab delay line okay i times t s and then substitute this into this result into this equation and you obtain um, this one this one so again so you have an input e to j omega t and output is also e to j omega t but there's extra bit is a scalar and we use p omega theta to represent this scalar this scalar will be called the beam response of this Weidman beam former to this e to j omega t this signal and so this p omega theta certainly is angle and frequency dependent okay beam response and uh, you can express this put all this into a vector b omega theta and uh, put this into a vector 
coefficient vector w. So this beam response can also be expressed in this vector form. So wh times d omega theta. So d omega theta is a steering vector for this wideband beam former. Okay. If you look at it in detail, it's given by this. Okay. Basically, you put all these components into this vector. Okay, this is called the steering vector of this wideband beamformer. Okay. And for URA with inter-element space in D, and we have again, so tau m equal to m times tau one, and then you have this. And to avoid uh, aliasing, we choose this D smaller than um, lambda minimum over two. So lambda minimum correspond to the highest frequency of the signal of interest is omega max, okay? Um, we assume the operating frequency of the ray is given by this. So from omega minimum to omega max. And D, okay, equal to alpha times, this is the lambda minimum over two to the unit. So we have extra scalar alpha, extra value. So this coefficient alpha will control the spacing of the array. You can, if you want to increase it, you can increase this value of this alpha. And and in this discrete form, as I mentioned, so TS is a temporal sampling period of the system and should be no more than half the period T minimum of the signal component with the highest frequency um, omega max. So this sampling period TS should be smaller than or equal to T minimum over two. And with normalized frequency omega, big omega equal to small omega times Ts, okay? And then you substitute all this into, all these values, these choices into the equation. And then you can find the beam response P big omega theta, because in digital form, we deal with normalized frequency, right? Not the real frequency anymore. So big omega theta, okay? It substitute all this, you get this result. And the final, the second line is, okay, you see here, this WMI, I from zero to J minus one, this is the coefficients attached to sensor M. So, and this E to minus J I omega. You see what, this is the, uh, this, this is the discrete time for DTFT, discrete time for transform of the coefficient vector or coefficient, a set of coefficients associated with sensor M. So it's big W sub M brackets. So E to J big omega. This is the DTFT, discrete time for transform of the coefficients associated with sensor M, okay? And then, so this gives you one easy way to calculate this beam pattern. You do this discrete time for transform, or you know, it's what you need to discretize this omega. So it will be DFT. You perform DFT to this coefficients for sensor M and all of them, then you multiply with this, you get the um, final result in response, okay? And if you ch choose this alpha equal to one, TS equal to this, then this mu here, this mu will be equal to one, will be uh, very simple. So E to minus J M big omega sine theta times this DTF, uh, DTFT result. And uh, now given the coefficients of the wideband beam former, we can draw its 3D beam pattern, right? It is P big omega theta with respect to frequency and uh, DOA angle theta. And to calculate the beam pattern for N theta number of discrete DOA values and N omega number of discrete normalized frequencies and N theta by N omega matrix, is obtained, right? Holding the response samples on the defined DOA frequency grid. And as an example, we consider this um, simple array with five sensors and the TDL length is J equal to three. And the coefficient is actually very simple. It's first set is zero, 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 zero. First five is zero. Second five is uniform and the remaining five there are zeros, okay. And then for this simple beam former with this set of simple coefficient, then 
you can draw the beam pattern following this. And it's n omega equal to 50, n theta equal to 60. And in dB, it's like this. It's like this. Okay, here's the angle, here's the frequency. You see, when you reduce the frequency, the beam wave will increase. And the frequency is zero, then you don't have a beam anymore, right? So certainly for DC signal, direct current signal, you don't, you can't form any beam, okay? Uh, so in this example, the values of the weight coefficients are fixed. And the result beam former will maintain a fixed response independent of the signal interference scenarios. Okay, the response is fixed. In statistically optimum beamforming, the weight coefficients need to be updated based on the statistics of the array data. So when the signal changes, the beamformer should adjust itself, right? To make sure you always have the best result. Okay, when the data statistics are unknown or time varying, adaptive optimization is required. And according to different signal environments and application requirements, different beamforming techniques may be employed. So you have two classes of beamformers. One is fixed, right? You have a fixed, the coefficients are constant, okay? They are constant, okay? So you, you will not change it. But for this second class of beamformers, you, they are not constant anymore. You need to adjust their values according to the change of the signal environment. Um, so in this tutorial, we'll deal with both of them. And in the next section, we'll talk about this fixed one first. So for section 3.1, so design of fixed wideband beamformers, okay. And the fixed beamformer, wideband beamformer, the simplest one is the so-called delay and sum beamformer. Okay, delay and sum beamformer. You see here. So if you signal, if the signal comes from this direction theta, you want to receive it. Okay, then because there's delays, right? Different delays. So you add extra delay to make sure at here the signal will be aligned. The different copies will be aligned here. So basically, it looks like if you look at from the set of signals here, it looks like the signal comes from the broad side. Okay. So because I add extra delays, so all the signal will arrive these points with the same delay. And then because they have the same delay, look like they look like coming from the road side of the array. So it's theta equal to zero. Then here, you can just add them together. This coefficient will be one, 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 one. So you just add them together. So delay and the sum. So this is delay and the sum informer. It's a very simple fixed wideband beam former. Okay. It's simple, but it cannot deal with complicated scenarios. Like in this, in this design, you only need to know the direction of the signal, but you could have signals, interference signals, right? What you can do with those interference signals? So you need to find another way to find the set of coefficients which can give you a good signal reception for the signal coming from the desired direction, but also you need to suppress the signals coming from the interfering direction, right? So in that case, you need to do the optimization. So in general, this fixed beamformer design problem is called array pattern synthesis problem, okay? So how to synthesize the pattern to achieve the desired beamforming in fact, and uh, the, there are many two classes of design approaches. Um, the first one is iterative optimization. So you don't have a, um, a direct result, okay? You need to do the optimization iterative, iteratively, okay? So you can employ many iterative optimization methods to do this design. And the second one is the analytic approach. And in this approach, you can obtain the result directly, okay? Just the mathematics, you have a closed form solution, basically, okay? So this includes the classic least squares formulation and the eigenfilter-based solutions, okay? And without loss of generality, all of the design examples in this tutorial in here, uh, in this part, are based, based on the URAs, okay? And it's straightforward 
to extend the discussed design to other array geometries in most of the cases where the general form of beamformers response is used. So we, you know, for different beamformers, different geometries, you only need to change this D, right? So in this following derivation, you know, we, we just use the general form D omega theta. We don't need to specify the value, the structure, okay? So A to be applicable to any um, array geometries, okay? But we'll use URA as example. So for the iterative approach, okay, the formulation is quite general. So given this desired beam pattern PD, D is desired, omega theta, the design of a beam former meeting the desired response can be considered as a general optimization problem and solved by employing all kinds of iterative optimization methods like this one. So like a min max design. So this is the designed response. This is the desired response, the error. You want to minimize the maximum value. Maximum value, you minimize it. So you max minimize the maximum difference between the designed and the desired responses. Here is V omega theta is a weighting function. Okay, you can emphasize some errors uh, more by assigning a larger value in this uh, weighting function for that specific direction or frequency. And many of the pattern synthesis problems can be reformulated into the convex form and solved efficiently, efficiently employing the available convex optimization toolboxes. Okay. Now for the simple um, but effective method is least squares method, it's an analytic approach. It can give you a closed form uh, solution to the design problem. So the least squares problem it's a traditional subject and has been well studied in this past. So given this PD omega theta, such a problem arises naturally by minimizing the sum of the squares of the error between this PD omega theta and the design response P omega theta over the frequency range of interest omega PB and the range of signal arrival angle of this big, this range, okay, is theta. So this is the error. So this is the uh, designed, this is the desired, this error squared, do the integration, and you want to minimize this. So that's a least square, least squares formulation, standard formulation. And if you like, you can add the weighting function determined by yourself, okay, um, to form a weighted least square problem. And then um, you can, this P omega theta equal to what? equal to this, right? You sub substitute these values into this formulation, okay? And uh, basically, the least squares uh, cost function is given by this, okay? And uh, this is a standard for, uh, it's a general uh, step, okay? You can, it's applicable to many other, like FR filter design, you also have this similar formulation. So you have all the results, and they are given by this. And uh, then the optimum solution can be obtained by taking the gradient of this cost function with respect to WH and then setting it to zero. And then you obtain the optimum solution. So that's the uh, advantage of least square based design. It can give you a closed form solution directly. Okay. You don't need to do uh, any iteration. Okay. And here's an example. So we have a wideband beamformer with. 10 sensors as a uniform uh, linear array and the J equal to 20 types following each sensor. The band lobe direction is the broad side. So theta zero is zero degrees and the range. Uh, so we only choose one direction for the main lobe, theta zero. And the zero response is given by this for this main lobe direction. And the side lobe area is from minus 90 to minus 20 and 20 to uh, 90, so it's symmetric, okay. And we sample it with 100 points and 50 points for each side, for this side, 50 points, this side, 50 points. Because when you do this, in, you don't do this integration, you just uh, do the approximation, sample it, discretize this integration area, okay. And then for weighting function, the main lobe part is 0.6 and the side lobe part is 0.4. 
and the frequency range of interest is from 0.3 pi to pi. Okay, this range, you discretized the range into 20 points. And then this is the design result. Okay, so normalized frequency from 0.3 pi to pi, this DOA angle theta. You see the response, you can have them, you have achieved this maximum response for the direction zero degree. This is, this is zero degree right here. And the side lobe is a much smaller value, okay. And you look at this, basically you look at it in this direction, in this uh, angle, it will be like this. So it's a good design. So maximum response for desired direction and uh, very low response for the side lobe level, okay, for, uh, for these two areas. And in this least squares formulation, it's possible to add some additional constraints to restrict the response of the beamform at some specific directions or frequencies. So like you want to have a zero response for one direction and some frequency, right? You can add it as a uh, constraint. Um, the constraints can be of either equality or inequality, okay? And for the linear equality constraints, a closed form solution can be found using the method of Lagrange multipliers. So like if you have a constraint like this, C, H, W equal to F, so you have a constraint for this W, right? And C is a constraint matrix, okay? Then you have this formulation. For this kind of formulation, you also have a closed form solution, okay, using Lagrange multipliers method. Um, another thing is, okay, for the earlier design results, we can see that the beam width of the resulting beamformer normally increases with the decrease of signal frequency, right? Which is due to the fact that for fixed aperture, the spatial resolution of a beamformer is proportional to frequency. You see here. So when you reduce the frequency, the beam width also, it will increase, right? So here narrower and uh, wider and wider. And uh, you see the remember this one also, right? For pi is quite narrow, but when you reduce the frequency, the main lobe will, uh, will the wave will increase. So that's uh, uh, one property for the normal, you know, wide, Find beam form design result. You all normally you see this kind of uh, phenomenon. Okay. In order to achieve, so some people ask, so is it possible to achieve a constant beam width response? So not changing with respect to frequency anymore. Okay, we call it the frequency independent or frequency environment response. So the response will be frequency environment. So it's a constant beam width. So this beam width will stay constant for all the frequency range of interest, okay? And we can design that, okay, you have a closed form solution, okay? The idea is, okay, to design such a beam form, we need to incorporate a measurement of this property, this frequency environment uh, response, this property, this requirement into this original formulation. And the easy way is to add additional constraints to make sure the difference between the response at reference frequency omega zero and other frequencies is limited to a very small value of epsilon. So when you become frequency environment, then the response, the change of the response with respect to frequency will be very small, right? So if you can limit that change to a very small value, then you will be able to achieve a, a frequency, almost frequency independent response, right? So specifically, so we can constrain this mean squared difference error over the full frequency environment region in this design. So this omega zero is a response at the reference frequency and this omega is any other frequencies, right? You do the integration, that's the total error, right? That's the change, the variation of the response of the beamformer with respect to frequency, right? So if you, you use this value, you do this integration, that's a total error, at right? frequency variance, which gives you an indication of the variance of this response with respect to frequency. 
and uh, this one okay you can get it in this simple form and you add this extra so this one this part you add this to the original cost function okay and you have a um, trade-off factor this gamma okay so this is originally the square um, design cost function this is the frequency environments this kind of the measurement okay you want to minimize both Certainly in here, you can change this. Okay, this cost function for this square cost function, you don't need to calculate the error for the whole frequency range. You can only calculate the error for one frequency because here, this is a frequency variance, right? If it's frequency variance, then all frequencies, for all frequencies, you have the same response. So you can only need to, you only need to measure the error for one frequency here in this cost function, this part. So you add these two part, um, with this trade-off factor is gamma determined, okay? It's gamma times this and one minus gamma times this. And then you can obtain a solution, closed form solution, okay, given by this. And here's a design example from no problem, four pi to pi. And you can see the main beam wave is quite, looks like quite constant, right? And another approach, so apart from this uh, standard least squares formulation, right? Another approach which can provide a closed form solution to the fixed wideband beam formal design problem is an eigenfilter approach. It is similar to this uh, least square formulation, okay? Unlike the least squares one, no matrix inversion is required for this class for method. So for eigenfilter approach, so here you see the matrix inversion, right? For eigenfilter uh, based approach, it's also based on the least square formulation, okay? But uh, no matrix inversion is required when you, uh, when you try to calculate the optimal solution. The term eigenfilter is referred to as a filter with its coefficients being the elements of eigenvector. So and in addition to the traditional standard eigenfilter approach, there are also many different variations of it in which finding the generalized eigenvector of two matrices is normally involved, such as the uh, maximum energy approach and total least squares approach and so on. And more details about them you can uh, can be found from the reference one. Okay, so this is the first part, and the next uh, we talk about the second part of this tutorial. So the remaining three sections. <laughs>